begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Thank you that we've all found a way to get to class today, despite the parking situation. Hmm. <laughs> Be with us today. <laughs> Guide our work. Lord, help us to glorify you in what we do, Lord. You know, I pray. Amen. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay, so So here is an example. We'll look at this uh, complex, Let's say P0. P1, P2. So look at this simplicial complex. We're going to calculate its uh, tomology. OK, so um, basically the story is here, we have to um, come to terms with the different, different chains, right? And um, so <coughs> our wish goal, calculate the um, the dimension of the kth homology group. All right, so remember, HK is equal to the um, cycles mod the boundaries like this, and um, let's see here. So we could, I think it's helpful to draw a little picture. Um, here's zero, zero chains, um, the one, one chains, the two chains, all right, and then we have this boundary operator that takes us from one thing to the next, right? So this is where the second boundary works, here's the first boundary one, boundary zero. Um, in particular, we have this definition. ZK is equal to the kernel of the kth boundary map, and BK is equal to the image of the kth, k plus 1th boundary map. So <coughs> what's the dimension then? What's the dimension of HK with all this setup? Dimension of the kth homology group is just what? Dimension of cycles minus the dimension of the boundaries. And let's see here, what is that? That's uh, in terms of these maps, it's the dimension of the, it's the dimension of the kernel of the kth boundary minus the dimension of the image of the kth plus oneth boundary. So basically to uh, calculate these, and remember what this is called? This is the, the Betty number. This is the kth Betty number. OK. so. What we're going to do, we're just going to just work it, work it out, work out what is the, what is the rank and, you know, um, what's the dimension of the, the image, and we can do that. Uh, let's start out with, uh, let's see here. So to, in order to calculate, um, let's see here, where should we start? How about H0? What do I need to look at there? What's the kernel of the partial zero map, right? And what's the image of the partial one map? These are the things I need to come to term with, come to terms with, right? Okay, so partial zero maps what? It maps the zero chains 
and there's nothing below zero chains, right? Zero chains are points, just they're formal linear combinations of points, right? So everything maps to zero under the boundary zero map. That means that the kernel is the whole thing, right? So this is just equal to C zero k. Now, what is C zero k? It's something like um, a a zero p zero plus a one p one plus a two p two. I mean, fine, such that a zero a one and a two are real constants. It's all formal linear combinations of the the zero chains, which are points. Okay. So what's the what's the dimension then? Right, dimension of kernel sigma. This is equal to three. All right. Um, so how about what is you know what is what does C one look like? I guess we should talk about that. What do the one chains look like? Oh wait a minute. I've already messed this up. No, no. OK, so what do one, cha one chains look like line segments, right? So let's see here. I guess I really should write this at the start. What is the stru you know, what's the structure of, I mean, let me just get it out here. C, C0, OK is basically the convex, convex hole of, uh, oh, well, that's a bad notation. It's, you know, A0, P0 plus A1, P1 plus A2, P2, such that, you know, A0, A1, A2 real numbers. What does C1K look like? It's something like B0, and you could do P0 to P1 plus, um, B1, let's say um, P1, P2, yeah. P2, P, yeah, P2, P0. Such that, you know, B0, B1, B2 are reals. So these are both three dimensional. Um, and then what's C2? Now, I, I guess here it's somewhat a question of like whiteboard ambiguity. If I had meant to this to be the solid triangle, I would have shaded it in, right? So in fact, that's it. Like C2 is zero. There's no two chain here. I'm just talking about the triangle, not the solid filled in triangle. So C2K here is zero. Oh, if it was filled in, then we'd also have um, P0, P1, P2. That's our next example. Um, so, all right, so we need to figure out what's the image of the boundary one map, right? So what does boundary one map look like? What's it act on? Something, t a typical element in C1K, which is what? Yeah, P B0 times P1 p2 plus b1 times p2 comma p1, right? Plus what? Plus uh, b2 times p2 p0. And so what is that? So. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my zero become, it's got squashed. That was, yeah, sorry. Lost in translation here. What on earth did I do? Um, what's up? Yeah. I don't even know. It wasn't one error. It was like a, a whole host of errors. 
Oh, really? I said it right, but wrote it wrong? Yeah. Oh, goodness. There's some kind of like temporal anomaly in my mind. I, mean, I need to... Uh, <laughs> well, they tried to put me in a special class when I was in first grade because I had they, they said I had dyslexia. I couldn't learn to read. It's a true story. My mom looked at that quote-unquote professional educator and said, really? Because I remember from medical school that when a first grade child has third grade math skills, they don't have dyslexia. What they have is a bad teacher. I'll be taking my son away from school now. Thank you. And she took me home and taught me to read. I think that was the day my mother's belief in professionals died. It was a good day. Well, you know, losing faith in professional quote unquote teachers is the first step. Was this a public school or a private school? Public school. Government school, to be more specific. And Bortzian in my, in my speech. But, um, okay, so that's by definition what it is. P1 minus P0, P2 minus P1, P2 minus P0. And then you can rewrite this, right? You can rewrite this in terms of um, the P0 coefficient. So like for P0, I have, oh man, Zero. that's weird. OK, fine. B1 what? B1 plus B2? That seems very likely. Um, let me step back away from it. Oh, here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that one, right? Yeah. Well, I feel better about this now because it was not what I had worked out earlier. Okay, so B0 minus P2. And... Oh. All right. Okay, so if we um, look at you know these p0 to p1, p1 to p2, p2 to p0, and c1k as a basis, right? That's a basis for this three-dimensional vector space. If we look at p0, p1, and p2 as a basis for this other three-dimensional vector space, the matrix, right, with respect to the basis which I've exhibited, the matrix of the partial one map is just the following. It's um, Let's see here. Minus one, zero, one. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. <sighs> I can't think today worth anything. I'm not sure if that should be the. Think about this for a second here. So the matrix, <laughs> sorry, let me just, the matrix of this with respect to the basis, it should be like partial one of the first, the first thing in the basis. So it's a partial one maps from C1K to, to C0. So C1K, the first thing would be P0, P1, the coordinate vector of that, let's say. Then the coordinate vector of partial one of the second thing, which would be P1, P2, right? And then the coordinate vector of partial one of the last thing, which was <coughs> P2, 
P naught, right? So that's how we calculate the matrix of a, a linear operator with respect to a basis. The first column depends on the first basis in the domain. The second column depends on the second basis element in the domain. The third column depends on the third basis element in the domain. Now, partial one of this is just a, that mean that just basically means set what? Think of this as being, we're going to put B1 and B2, B0, and B0 is equal to 1. So if you look at that, if, if B0 is equal to 1 and the other two are 0, you get P0 minus P0, right? Um, P1 and 0, right? In other words, you get minus 1, 1, 0. Now here, if we put B1 equal to 1, B0 equal to B2 equal to 0, that gives me what? That gives me none of these, right? Minus one of those. And how many of these? One. Mm -hmm. That's the one, right? And then over here, we've got B2 equals to 1. B0 equals to B1 equals to 0. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other ways to do the calculation. The, the, the point of this is just that if you look at the matrix of a linear transformation, then you can easily ascertain what's the dimension of its kernel, what's the dimension of its rank, because there are also the corresponding rank of the column space and the null space of the matrix, right? Um, if you look at this, you can see that if you add, no, let's see here. If you, how do you get this to, hmm. Oh, okay. So basically row one plus row two times minus one gives me row three, which means they're linearly dependent. And you can easily see that that's it. I mean, it's definitely rank, it's not rank one. If it was rank one, they'd all be multiples of each other, and that's clearly not the case. So this has rank two, right? And there, then, therefore, it follows that <coughs> this has the dimension of the image of partial one equals to two by calculation below. So it doesn't it doesn't get all. I mean the uh, the boundary boundary one operator. It doesn't hit all possible things in the zero chains. It hits about two thirds, right? <laughs> There's something missing. Anyway, that said, we can calculate what what's beta zero then. Beta zero is equal to what is it? Three minus two. One. So there you go. There's the, um, the, the, you know, in other words, the zeroth, um, co zeroth homology here is just the reals up to isomorphism. Now let's calculate H1K. What do I need to analyze there? I need to analyze the kernel of what? Boundary one, right? And the image of boundary two, right? The kernel of boundary two, kernel of boundary one has dimension one by this calculation right here. Rank nullity theorem, right? Rank plus nullity has to give you number of columns. So the null space of this is one dimensional, which is also the same as the dimension of the kernel of the boundary one map. So that is dimension one by our calculation we already did. How about boundary two? What's that look like? What's boundary two do? Right. 
Right, so this, this says that the boundary two map is equal to the zero map. So the image, the image and the kernel of this map are zero. It's kind of a stupid map. So the image has dimension zero as well. So again, we get that beta one is equal to one minus zero, which is equal to one. Therefore, the first homology over k is also equal to the reals up to isomorphism. Furthermore, I mean, there's an endless chain of zeros above here, right? Like, I mean, there's, there's boundary three here, and you can at least in trivially talk about them. Out to infinity, zero, 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 zero. Zero maps all the way up. And so there you have it. In total, the story is this, the homology um, over the kth homology over big K, or I'll tell you what, let me use a J just so it looks different. It's equal to one if J is equal to zero or one, and it's equal to zero if um, oh I'm sorry the reals um, and it's 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 um, yeah just the zero if if J is, is is greater than or equal to two. So this, this corresponds to the fact that the, the jth beta, like beta zero and beta one are equal to one, but beta sub j is equal to zero for j greater than or equal to two. <coughs> okay? Now we can simply modify this example. What happens if we fill in? Well, before I do that though, before I do that, what is this, what's the significance of this to something more? I mean, triangles are interesting and all, but what's more interesting is that this, you can do what? You can continuously deform this to like this thing. In other words, this triangle is a triangulation of the, of the circle. And as um, is explained in, in Rentland in, in some, some detail, the, um, the homology of this is equal to the homology of that. So in doing this, in calculating the homology of this little simplicial complex, we have thus calculated just the same, the homology of the circle. <clears throat> so if we fill in the triangle, which is exam the next example. This was example 5.4. This is now example 5.5, .5, I think. So if you fill in the triangle, right? So my first simplicial complex had dimension one, right? The maximal chain in it had dim it was, the, it was a line segment, basically. If we fill in the triangle, then we have a simplicial complex of dimension two. The dimension is also, I mean, by definition, it was the dimension of the largest non-trivial chain. If I fill it in, this changes, right? C2K is no longer zero. C2K is now like some constant. I don't know what you want to call it. C0. Oh, kind of a bad letter. Let's call it lambda. I don't know. P0, P1, P2. Right? Such that lambda is a real. I mean, it's a one dimensional thing. And now we can calculate the boundary two map. Right? It's actually something non-trivial. What's boundary two map look like now? Boundary two on um, P0, P1, P2, what is that? We calculated this last time, actually. This was um, P1, P2 minus um, P0, P2 uh, plus P1, P, uh, P0, P1, right? So anyway, we don't need to do any kind of fancy calculation here to see that the um, image of boundary two, the dimension of the image of boundary two is what? It's one, it's always just a scalar multiple of this thing, which is a particular sum of one chains. So the dimension of this is one. What's the dimension of the, what's the, um, well, do we even need that? Let's see what else do we need. Okay, so as we go back over these calculations, does anything change for this? 
no, the, the, the story remains the same between the zero chains and the one chains. What, what's, what's different? Over here, you see, now the image of the boundary two map is what? As dimension one. And so we have one minus one. In fact, we have zero. And so the difference is if we have a disk, right, then the dimension, you know, so this is, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's zero. There. Um, <coughs> Okay, so anyway, um, one of the homework problems I assigned you guys was to calculate the homology of a two-sphere. And then he says, once you've done that, conjecture what it is for. I think, well, I think it's for the, uh, it's for like the, basically a spherical shell and then for a solid ball. Just like, just like here we did for the circle and then for the closed disk, like you could try to go through the same thing in three dimensions. So if you think about a spherical shell, right, you can inscribe on it um, I don't know, I can't do it worth anything, but <laughs> you could imagine if you were a better artist and <laughs> yeah, I know if you had thought through this picture more, you could see how you can inscribe a tetrahedron in it, right? And that gives you a um, you know, a a simplicial complex, which is a triangulation of the, uh, of the sphere. And then you can calculate its homology, much like we've done here. And then you could then fill it in, right? Then you'd have up to three chains. You go through the same kind of calculation to figure out what the homology is there. And then the pattern is going to be very, very similar to what we did here, so you can conjecture what it, what it continues to be for higher balls and boundaries. So. Okay. Any questions? Or well, I'm afraid to ask <laughs> any questions. I don't know if I can answer them <laughs> at the moment. <sighs> so for all the problems where we calculate homology, we're allowed to uh, use triangle loop like reverse triangle space. Yes. That's Even if we don't provide the explicit. Yeah, you, I, I, a picture suffices uh, for the proof that there's a triangulation. I'm being, I, yeah, I, I'm, you notice I just drew a picture here and I didn't tell you the formula for phi. I mean, uh, I mean, the formula for phi is essentially this. Um, imagine your triangle is um, basically three, uh, three jelly beans with a, um, like a, a rubber band between them and then you glue these three jelly beans to a circle, right? And then like you imagine like blowing air into it somehow, it can bind to some sort of two-dimensional plane. And then as you blow air, in, air into it, the, 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 you know, the, the rubber bands kind of bow out to the, the circular container. That process is, is, is this V mapping. It's a continuous warping basically of this. To that, you know. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Would it what? That's why I said we put the jelly beans on the edge of a circular boundary so that as we blow it out, it's forced into the circular mold. What if they're glued? I don't know. I give up. I give up. You get it. I'll let you guys come up with the explicit map. How about that? But uh, <coughs> um, 
OK, OK, OK. So um, anyway, I think I've shown you enough here that you've got a pretty decent shot at the calculating the homology of the ball and the, and the sphere without too much trouble. Now, that said, after my conversation with Nathan earlier today, I would, I would strongly caution against thinking too deeply about that cone problem in the homework, because doing that will necessitate you learning about a quarter of worth of the topology course. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> to carefully define continuity and open and close, there, 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 there's, there's a pretty steep learning curve for that, that problem. Um, I just, it looked interesting. I, I was, it looked interesting. <laughs> I should have probably not assigned that one. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so I want to talk about the generalized Stokes theorem. I am uh, no, I do not want to stupid double click it and start opening up one of these Outlook. <laughs> so I'm going to cheat a little bit here, if you don't mind. Come on. All right. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> this is now a reading course, uh, <laughs> like literally. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you can't read. Oh, no. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Why are you in college? Oh, look, you broke Bradley. <laughs> I think we broke him like halfway through the lecture. Oh. Okay, so the um, this I th this might show up okay actually, but yeah, hit debatable. Can we keep the back? Yeah, that that's better. That should be okay. Um, basically, the idea here is. We want to describe how do you integrate a differential form. Okay. Now, um, before I get lost in, well, let's just read along basically. So the the problem is the simplicial complexes we've talked about so far. I mean, they're great, but the trouble with these is that they're closed sets, right? And we really want to, um, you know. We, we end up needing to talk about something that's open, but even that's not enough. We need something that's smooth. So he introduces this notion of a smooth singular simplex. It's an equivalence class of, of triples where you have one simplex and another simplex and some kind of a natural order preserving a fine map between them. And he sets up the theory of integration over these things. I don't want to get lost in the details because I will get lost. Um, <coughs> I'm going to just. So I'm sorry I'm being a little bit vague about that. But um, you can also calculate the homology with respect to the smooth, so-called smooth singular homology, which would be done with sort of the smooth, the smooth analog of the circle here, or the corresponding simplicities of those. Anyway, we're not going to get into those details. It's just you know this is when you study these things more deeply, you can read more. So what we're really interested in is how do you integrate on chains? So a chain, all right, so basically, what's a chain? I mean, the stupid kind of chain is literally line segments or triangles that are filled in, right? Or in three dimensions, um, you know, the face of a tetrahedron, a solid tetrahedron, basically the edges of triangles, filled in triangles, and higher dimensional analogs of these are chains. And then you can take unions of these things, right? So that, that gives you a, a wide class of geometric shapes that you can integrate over. If we can describe how to integrate a form on a chain, 
then we can use that as a building block to kind of like, well, basically, the notion of the smooth uh, singular homology is that you can take those basic triangular shapes and kind of like bubble them out into smooth chains that fill out your, your space. This is what the formalism is trying to do. Um, so the basic question then is, how would you integrate like an n form on Rn? So suppose you have, and there's only one, right? There's just a function of x1 through xn and then dx1 wedge dxn. How do you how do you think you integrate that over some sort of region in Rn? It's what's that by parts? It's simpler than that. It's just erasing the wedges. You just drop the wedges and just do the n usual n you know n fold integration. That's how you integrate the form on Rn. It's just that. Like if I wanted to integrate, um, well, excuse me, if I wanted to integrate x squared dx wedge dy wedge dz over the two sphere, the, well, excuse me, not two sphere, the ball um, in three dimensions, all right, the unit ball, let's say, that would actually be equal to the triple integral over x squared plus y squared plus z squared less than or equal to the whatever the radius of the ball was, right? If it's a unit ball, I guess that'd be 1. x squared dx dy dz. That's it. That is how you integrate the form in that context. So the question is then, how do we integrate forms in more general contexts, like over sort of arbitrary curves subsets of Rn, manifolds, if you will? That's that's the thing we're trying to describe here. Um, <clears throat> but that's that's the definition. I mean, uh, I mean, there there's a question here. The, the, I guess the distinction between this and that is if I switch. I mean, there's there's something going on here. If I switch dx and dy, I get minus, right? So there's some sort of implicit orientation here that's not over here, right? How, how would you integrate on that plot boundary? Would it be three of the R for any one space? On the boundary? I can't integrate a three form on a two dimensional space. Okay, so what would you do in that? Well, some of your homework problems are about how to take um, you know, a P form and induce a P minus one form in a natural way on the boundary. So there is, there is a, there's a discussion to be had there. Um, my intuition for it is something like, I mean, let me show you a stupidly simple example about that. Um, here's my thinking. So suppose that this is my space, M. My, I suppose M is the solid cube. Right, so this is like the boundary of M, the boundary of M. So I, I don't know how to how to how can I put M in the middle? I don't know. <laughs> the whole thing is M. Okay. So. So on M, you have the volume form dx wedge dy wedge dz, right? What's the volume form on the boundary? I think that the volume form on this should just be dx wedge dy. I have a strong suspicion that on the lower side it should be like minus dx wedge dy. I think over here, goodness gracious, the volume form, quote unquote volume form, I mean really area form, should be, you know, like dy wedge dz or something like that. And so forth. But in order to Oh, I'm s yeah, this was, that's not a good one. Um. I'm not very sure about the signs here. And so the only kind of form, the only kind of two form I could integrate, I mean, I guess I could integrate other two forms here, but the, 
in a trivial sense, but the natural two form that would give me something non trivial on the top face would only be a two form that was built from like dx wedge dy. Here, the only kind of two form that's going to give me a non trivial integral is something that's built from dx wedge dz. Um, okay, so. So he just, here he says what I just said, which was that you drop the wedges, right? Here's a token example. Um, so <clears throat> getting back to the more general story, if M is a smooth manifold and omega is a k-form on M, and C is a smooth singular k-chain, all right, which means it's kind of like a, a smooth, a, a, it's like a bubbling, a, a, a smoothing out of a k-chain. Right, which is some sort of formal sum of simplicial um, complexes, right? I mean, sim simplices, rather. In other words, the k-chain can be written as a formal linear combination of particular simplices, right? And so if you can understand how to do the integration on a simplex, a particular simplex, then you just add those together, and that, that gives you the integration. Um, so the definition then is to integrate over the, the, over the chain, you just take the sum over the pieces that make up the chain, the sum over the simplices in the chain. It's basically just break it up into a sum over these generalized triangles. But again, there's their smoothed out triangles, like he has a nice picture of next here. And so his definition um, is that the integration over the, the, the sigma chain is by definition the integration over the uh, pullback, I mean, over the corresponding um, k simplex. Now, this k simplex is in Rn, right? And this is the pullback of omega from the manifold back to Rn. Now, once the, once, the, once the differential form is on Rn, then we just drop the wedges and integrate. So that, that's how this is working, is you take this, pull this sort of generalized curvy triangle back to a boring, you know, triangle triangle, generalized triangle in Rn, and you integrate that thing by just dropping the wedges. <coughs> All of this has to respect change of variables. Here's a, here's a nice picture of what's going on. Well, this is actually a picture of him motivating, I mean, here he's really discussing that the definition is natural because you see the, the, the choice of um, how you pull back to Rn is not unique. You know, for a given, say, triangulation of the, of, the, of the manifold, you could perhaps pull back in different ways to Rn. But you have to pull back, if you compare two of these pullbacks to Rn, you have to have some sort of consistency. And that's what he's dealing with here. He's, um, but, this, this is, well, it's going to go on. If I can't say something useful, I won't say something. <laughs> um, so here he's just bridging the gap between the integration of omega over the smooth singular n chain, smooth, rather smooth n, smooth chain, k chain rather, and so here's the, here's the integration of omega done with respect to one sort of, uh, let's say, I need some word for it, um, straightening of the end chain. Here, here's the integration done with respect to a different straightening. They're, they're, they're the same. It doesn't matter which one you pull back to, you get the same, the same integral. Now he works through that more carefully over here. Basically it's just, now, I mean, I wish I had a little bit more time this semester. I could make this a little bit more explicit, but we looked back, we looked at the, the formulas for pullbacks of differential forms, remember? And what we picked up on was that they, they pick up determinants, basically, right, of um, particular parts of the mapping you're looking at. And when you flesh that out here, when you look at the pullback of these, these end forms from sort of different coordinate systems on the manifold, what you pick up is this determinant of the coordinate chains map, but then if you work through that, the reason that they're equal is exactly the change of 
the change of variables theorem from calculus three, which is based on the determinant of the Jacobian between the you know the coordinate change. So it, it, it's very very um, man. There, there's there's a, a, a more complete discussion here that could be tied back to our discussion of pullbacks that I just I'm not quite not quite where I need to be on this this semester. But I, I mean I see it, but I can't quite make it too explicit. Now here. He shows you what I claimed last class, which is that the integration of a one form over a curve is in fact the line integral in the proper context. So here it is. He's like, okay, so take um, this example rather. Um, a one form, a1 dx plus a2 dx2 plus a3 dx3, a one form on R3, gamma a curve, right? A curve is a singular one chain. Um, it's a one dimensional, right? It, a, a curve is just a line segment that's been bubbled out, right? I mean, so <clears throat> smooth, singular one chain. Um, so the image of the one chain is the curve, like that. And um, so there, it there you have it, the pullback of this one form. Ooh, ow, ow, ow. You ever hit your elbow on a corner? It's not cool. Um, <laughs> so the pullback under, under the curve of the one form, right? What that amounts to is what? You substitute in the formula for the curve into x, y, and z, and dx, dy, dz for the one form. That gets us to here, right? You, you take the first component, evaluate at the curve. You take the differential of the first component of the curve. That, that's what it means to pull back. It's a substitution, right? And when you do that, that's exactly the vector field evaluated as a curve dot with the gradient to the vector field dt. Hey, this is nothing more than the um, this is nothing more than the formula for the line integral when you integrate it. So there you have it. The integration of a one form corresponds to the integration of the corresponding vector field over the same curve. This notation I would usually write as d gamma dt. But whatever, I mean, this, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I agree with that. Eh. Eh. He must be thinking of gamma, oh, you know what, he's thinking of gamma as the, um, he's not thinking, well, this is weird. Yeah, he does say that. How do we have a dt? I mean, if he writes the gradient of gram gamma, he's thinking of, um, hmm, maybe I don't understand that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. I think if we think through it more carefully, the more proper thing to write here <laughs> is, uh, is, is gamma prime uh, or, or gamma dt times dt, because that's what you need for the line integral, not, not gradient. I don't know what gradient of gamma would mean. Gamma is a curve. Gamma is a function of, uh, I mean, unless he's saying that, I mean, he could, he would be within his rights to say that Gamma is a function from the reals to R3. So in, the case, in that case, the gradient is, in fact, d gamma dt. If that's what he means, then I agree. But gamma is a function of t. Unless I'm, I mean, gamma is a function of t. I mean, he's got gamma 1 and gamma 2, so he's th definitely thinking of gamma as vector valued. I think this has to be understood to be d gamma dt. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I, I can't. I'm not, I'm not going to bend on that. <coughs> so um, I may have assigned that exercise. Did I assign that exercise to you guys? 6.2? It'd be mission 6 or 7, yeah. Hmm. Oh well. 
it's too late. <laughs> but this is the corresponding, corresponding exercise to show you that the integral of a two-form over R3, in fact, does reproduce the, the surface integral. Now, if you read my notes, I pretty much just give you a formula that says you write down, you write down the, the differential form and components and then drop the wedges. That's all it really amounts to. And I explicitly, explicitly show in my notes that the, um, the way the differential form works, it reproduces the, uh, the surface integral formula. So that, that, that is in my notes. But um, anyway, OK, let's, let's, let's go on here. So the uh, Stokes theorem, <coughs> now that I have, um, um, I have projected something that defines the, uh, the integral of a, of a form, uh, I'm not sure if I've really defined it, but uh, it really is just what I said, though. You, you, you pull back to the Euclidean space under the chart, and um, well, I guess you pull it back under the patch, under parameterization, because parameterization goes from the Euclidean space space up to the manifold, right? So if I want to pull a form back from the manifold back to Euclidean space, I would, I would use a, a patch, because the pullback goes the opposite way. Um, anyway, that said, I want to talk about Stokes' theorem. And so he has two proofs of Stokes' theorems in here. Uh, so first of all, just to understand the fundamental theorem of calculus is an example of Stokes' theorem in this context, because the integral from uh, A to B is really integral along the line segment, right, which is a one chain, A to B, of this, which is just df. And then this, we can understand as the integral, quote unquote, over the zero chain, um, which is actually A and B. So, and the, the minus comes because it's an oriented zero chain, right? I mean, the zero chains are, their sums and differences of points. Basically, um, when you evaluate, you just, you, you pick up the minus there. And the boundary, of course, of AB is B minus A, which is where the minus is coming from, the boundary operator. OK, so, oops. So here's the Stokes theorem. One, for any k form omega and any k plus one chain c, uh, we have the following. The integral of the differential of the k form over the chain is equal to the differential, the integral of the, of the differential form over the boundary of the chain. Now, a chain is built from a formal linear combination of, simpl of simplices, right? So if you can derive, as it turns out here, as he argues shortly after this, if you, can, if you can prove the generalized Stokes theorem for a simplex, right, for, for an arbitrary, let's say, k plus 1 simplex, then you can just extend the result by linearity to get the whole thing. So the first proof he's going to give, he's just going to prove this theorem for a simplex. It's an arbitrary generalized triangle, basically, right? I don't think it's induction. It's more just, that's more just a plain old finite linearity argument. I mean, because by definition, the chain is built from a sum. I guess you might, there might be some kind of silly induction you could do here, I guess. But uh, um, I guess you can see induction in anything if you start looking for it. But uh, mm. now, so like he says, it suffices to prove it for a simplex like this. That's what he's going to show us next. Um, <clears throat> so for some k plus one simplex sigma, right? What's he have here? Sigma is s bar k plus one comma u comma phi. What what is what is the s bar k plus one, the u and the phi? Remember that's the the s bar k plus one is actually the the standard k plus one simplex in Euclidean space, and this this phi is that smoothing out map, right? So we're going to take um, this, right? I mean this is kind of a manga style calculation, right? This is calculated as that, well, rather as this. Because we pull back d omega to the straight, to the straight simplex back in Euclidean space. 
So this is a curvy simplex. It's some kind of curved triangle in the manifold. And you pull that back to a standard straight simplex under the, under the, smoothing, under the smoothing map phi. Then we use the property of the differential and the pullback, which is that they, they commute. And we're just left with integration of the differential of this over that. On the flip side, if the theorem is true, this is supposed to be what it's equal to, right? And this we trade for the integration. We pull back the uh, differential form omega to this differential form on Euclidean space, pull back of omega. And again, this is the boundary of that straight generalized triangle in Euclidean space. So you see now we've traded it from needing to prove it on a general curved simplex to simply needing to prove it for a straight one in Rn. It's therefore sufficient to prove that the integral of the differential of lambda is equal to the integral over lambda, the boundary of the simplex, and um, just over the k plus one, a k plus one simplex. Um, I had somebody do this as the capstone project in Math 450 last year, and like all they did, really all they did was to prove this, and they never explained why that was a proof of of the <laughs> generalized Stokes theorem. I think I still gave him an A, but man, I really should have been meaner. Don't worry, I'll get around to be meaner, meaner in the capstone course by the time you guys take it. Let's see, so, um, <laughs> joke's on me. <laughs> well said. <laughs> that's true, that's true. I mean, I could understand that joke in a couple of different ways, but um, let's see here. So, lambda. Here's a typical k-form. That's an arbitrary k-form, right, on rk. So <clears throat> this k plus 1 simplex is, it lives in rk plus 1, all right? And um, he says it's enough to prove it for this monomial. So he just looks at a typical k-form. That's not a, it's not a top form. And, um, there's some combinatorial sleight of hand he's doing here. He's just saying, well, just look at that one. That's enough. If you take the differential of a k-form, you, of course, get what? You get partial xa, partial xk plus 1, this. Now, why just that? Why, where's the other derivatives, right? We have to take the total differential of the component a in our k. Where's the rest of them? Why is it just that one? Yeah, the rest of them are zero because for anything except for x to k plus one, we have a dx1 wedge dx1 or dx1 wedge, dx2 wedge dx2. We have a repeated differential, so those wedge to zero. The only thing that remains of the exterior derivative is just this one term. Why the minus one to the k? Because we have to move the dxk past k differentials bup, 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 all the way to the end of the list. That's where that's coming from. That's actually really important, <laughs> that sign. So to integrate, the, the lambda is just to integrate this expression, right? But remember what I said? To do that integral, we do what? Drop the wedges, because we're talking about the integral of the differential form in Rn. And um, we have to integrate over the, um, the k, I'm sorry, the, 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 and maybe I can make this bigger so it's less fuzzy. So the, um, this k plus 1 simplex, what is it? It's, he's looking at the standard one, right? So it's, it's built from taking the convex hull of like e, um, e1, e2, e3, e4, da 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 da, e, ek, I think. Just, just the unit, the, unit uh, the standard basis, if you will, thought of as points convex hull of that, I believe, forms the k plus 1 standard simplex. You can see that from where he's got what? He's got like the coordinates are, are non-negative, and their sum 